Good evening. I'm Pastor Joanna Mitchell from Grace Lutheran Church in Andover. I am so glad you joined us for Holden Evening Prayer this evening. I hope that as we gather and pray that you will find yourself comforted by these familiar songs, prayers, and a message of hope. Our Wednesday worship will be posted on our website and on our Facebook page at 7 p.m. for the next few weeks. We also invite you to join us on Sunday mornings for virtual worship at 9.30 a.m. on our website and our Facebook page. We are indeed living in uncertain times. Each day provides another opportunity and a challenge in how to adjust to what is happening in the world around us. Many of us feel lonely and isolated, and we together are grieving many things. For some of us, that is the loss of a job, the loss of interaction with family and friends, and for others of us, that might be health concerns. Please know that we are holding all of these concerns in our prayers and holding you in prayer as well. Our world has been forced to slow down. It is hard. And yet, this unscheduled Sabbath time does provide an opportunity for us to rest, to pray, to read scripture, and to listen to God. We begin our worship this evening in the name of the triune God. Amen. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world.
May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us so that in union with all creation we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Hello, kids. Well, this is kind of weird, isn't it? Usually you're up here in the front of the church asking great questions and giving wonderful answers as we talk about what God is up to in the world. But here we are, meeting like this through video. And even though we miss you, we'll just have to make the best of it. Tonight, I'm wondering if you have a favorite anthem or song that gets you pumped up. You know, kind of like athletes listen to before they go out into the arena or the stadium. Sometimes you see them with their headphones on and they're listening to music or songs that get them excited and pumped up and ready to compete. I have a few favorite songs that I often listen to when I need to get energized and pumped up. Maybe my husband and I are having people come over and I have two hours to clean the house and get ready for guests. In that case, I often crank up my listening device and listen to some songs that you probably don't know, but that your mom and dad or grandparents do. Songs like Bob Seger's Old Time Rock and Roll, Dancing Queen by ABBA, and for sure, Crocodile Rock by Elton John. You'd be amazed at how quickly I can get my work done when I'm dancing to music as I do the work. But what about if you're nervous or scared? Last week, Christy asked you what you do if you feel this way. And you had some great answers. You said, we can pray. We can talk to a friend. Or we can talk to an adult, like your mom and dad. Sharing your feelings with someone you trust is really important and can be really helpful. But there's something else that can be helpful too, and that's music. One of my favorite songs to listen to and sing along with is a wonderful old spiritual called, He Never Failed Me Yet. In fact, I listened to it this morning because to be honest, I'm feeling kind of scared and nervous. I've never been videotaped doing a children's sermon or preaching. This is a new experience for me and it's kind of scary. But this song, He Never Failed Me Yet, helps me when I'm feeling this way because it's all about Jesus being with me in the scary times and about how God gives us strength no matter what we're facing. So it reminds me that even when I'm feeling nervous or scared and things don't go the way I hope they do, it's okay because Jesus is with me just like Jesus is with you and he'll help us get through even sad and difficult times. You might have a song like that that helps you too. I know one that I think all of you know. It's called Jesus Loves Me. And I'm going to ask some friends to come up here and sing it with me. And I hope that you'll all join in too. Friends? Thanks for listening. See you next time. The gospel reading for today is from the fourth chapter of Mark, verses 35 to 41. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, 
Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. But Jesus was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The Gospel of the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. The story of Jesus calming the sea is no doubt familiar to many of you. I've heard it countless times in my life, but I gained a deeper appreciation for this story on January 8, 2013, because on this particular day, my husband and I, joined by others from our church who had traveled to Israel and Palestine, had the opportunity to take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. Our plans for this event had been questionable because of unusual weather in the region, weather that had almost prevented us from seeing Nazareth, the town Jesus grew up in, because of torrential rains and severe flooding. And on the last day of our trip, 12 inches of snow would fall on Jerusalem, the most snow the region had seen in 20 years. January 8th, was another rainy, windy day. But we were determined to get out onto the Sea of Galilee, the very sea that Jesus himself and his disciples had been part of. The name of our boat was Faith, which was a good thing to keep in mind as the sky grew darker, the wind stronger, and the waters increasingly choppy. And as we rode across the swelling waves, I couldn't help but think of the disciples in their boat, in the dark of night, attempting to cross the stormy sea, which, by the way, is a lot bigger than I had realized. Mark says the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. I think I know the fear that the disciples felt. Many years ago, a storm came up as my friend Carolyn and I were canoeing on Crane Lake in northern Minnesota. As the storm grew worse, we paddled furiously to get to shore, but with little progress to show for it. The rain continued to pour down, the waves beat against our canoe, and the wind pushed us further and further away from the shore. Like the disciples, we too were afraid that we were going to perish. But unlike the disciples, we didn't have Jesus in our canoe. Eventually, growing increasingly tired and despite our best efforts, Carolyn and I swamped it. Which, as I remember, is when we began praying out loud. As it turned out, while Jesus may not have been in the stern of our canoe, he was with us in the storm all along. He showed up in the person who had spotted us through binoculars from his cabin window. Seeing that we were in distress, he got into his boat and came out to rescue us. I've always wondered how Jesus could be so oblivious to the raging storm. The winds were howling and the waves beating against the boat. Some of the disciples were no doubt rowing furiously or grappling with a sail, while others frantically scooped up the water as fast as they could, pouring it back into the sea. And in the midst of all this chaos, there's Jesus, sleeping like a baby. Was he always an exceptionally sound sleeper? Was he completely exhausted on that particular night? 
Or did he sleep so peacefully because he knew there was nothing to worry about and he wanted the disciples to get the message? If this was the intent, they clearly didn't get the message. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? They asked, they asked Jesus as they awakened him. It's a cry of fear, of doubt, and abandonment. And it's heard often in the stories of God's people. Where is God in the midst of my distress? Has God abandoned us? It is a cry we can all relate to, one that we ourselves may have uttered in the midst of our own suffering or in witnessing the suffering of others. Jesus hears their cry and immediately responds by calming the sea. Then he turns to the disciples with his own questions. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? How would we respond to these questions at this moment in time? The answer to the first one seems pretty obvious. All of us have concerns as in our lives as it is, but now COVID-19 has taken our anxiety to a whole new level. It's hard not to be afraid when public health officials are saying the United States has reached a tipping point warning that if we don't comply with recommendations from the CDC, it's very possible our hospitals and healthcare workers will be overwhelmed by the increasing number of cases. It's hard not to be afraid when life as we know it has changed drastically in the course of just a few days and we can't see the path ahead. It's hard not to be afraid when businesses are closing their doors and the most vulnerable among us, those already struggling to keep a roof over their heads and food on the table, are now struggling even more. The answer to the second question isn't as easy, at least not for me. I read a heartbreaking story the other day about a one-year-old boy, Bryce McCardle, who has a rare form of brain cancer and has just weeks to live. His parents, who fell deeply in love with their firstborn child from the moment he was born, talked about how grateful they are to be his parents and about the joy their little boy has brought into their lives. And they are determined to enjoy every moment they have left with him. They created a bucket list of things they want to experience with their son, like all the kid-friendly things at the Mall of America. Bryce loved the experience, and the family was even given a Bryce Was Here plaque to be mounted on the Mall of America's playground. Bryce's father said, just because we have a bucket list doesn't mean we've given up hope. It just means doctors have given us a certain time frame and we are going to live life fully for that duration. The faith of this little boy's parents is truly inspiring. Bryce's mother said, when he was diagnosed, we thought, do we trust God? Yeah. And that's when your faith is tested. Either we trust him or we don't. I remember thinking initially, she's right. Either we trust God or we don't. There's no in-between. But her words have stuck with me, and I've been pondering what that looks like in my own life. And I've come to realize that sometimes I am in the in-between. Yes, I have faith. But the degree of my faith can depend on the situation. The truth is that the times I trust God the most are those times when I have no control whatsoever over the situation. What else can I do but surrender completely to God? Of course, we like to think that we have more control than we really do over any situation, and we all know how quickly that can change. Sometimes my faith is strong and sure, and I feel that I trust God implicitly but at other times, 
My faith is shaky at best, and doubt gnaws at me. I know I'm not alone in this struggle, which is exactly why we need to be surrounded by the community of faith to encourage and support one another because the journey of faith is not an easy one. But ultimately, I don't think it's the measure of our faith that matters most anyway. What matters is that God's grace is immeasurable. I love the way a friend of mine put it the other day. My faith is not enough, but God's faithfulness is. Maybe the point of Jesus' question is to awaken in each of us the choice we have to make. We can focus on the fear and chaos in the world, feeling tossed about without the power and presence of God to anchor us. Or we can be open to hearing the message and promise of Jesus who has come into our midst and who offers a whole new future for our world and for our lives. The words from our gospel that have been resonating with me most these past few days are peace, be still. Jesus directed them at the sea, but I think they're meant for us too especially when peace eludes us and it's difficult to be still under the best of circumstances. So what practices can help cultivate calm and stillness in our lives in the midst of the fear that is gripping us? In her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, Dr. Brene Brown writes about her research on the relationship between joy and gratitude. One of the patterns that emerged from the stories she collected is this. Both joy and gratitude were described as spiritual practices that were bound to a belief in human interconnectedness and a power greater than us. Those are Brene Brown's words. I interpreted them this way. The more we practice joy and gratitude, the more we become aware not only of God's presence in our lives, but of our connectedness with other human beings. After all, we're all in this together. What does a gratitude practice look like? It might be keeping a journal in which you write what you are most grateful for each day. I know people who do this and say it has had a profound impact on them. It could be stopping at some point during the day to actually say these words out loud. I am grateful for fill in the blank or it could be focusing on gratitude in your daily meditation or prayers. Being intentional about practicing gratitude can help turn our focus away from our fears and remind us of God's faithful presence in our lives. Joy can be a spiritual practice as well. One of the things in life that brings me joy is music. Playing the piano, singing, or just listening to a beautiful piece that I know only God could have inspired somehow anchors me and helps me feel more connected not only to God, who has given me the gift of music, but to others. Joy and gratitude are inextricably linked. As I experience the joy of music, I can't help but give thanks for my parents who sacrificed so that I could have piano lessons. And suddenly I find myself giving thanks for teachers and composers and conductors and arrangers and instrumentalists. The list goes on and on. Music is a joy that helps sustain me even in the most difficult of circumstances. What brings you joy? Maybe it's experiencing nature, creating art, reading or writing, volunteering to help someone in need, being in conversation with a dear friend. Whatever it is, I encourage you to find ways to practice joy whenever you can. As we've heard again and again, these are unprecedented times. 
It will be important for all of us to find ways to cultivate calm and stillness in the midst of the storm we are facing. But we can take heart in Jesus' words, peace, be still. Because despite all the uncertainties we're facing, we can be absolutely certain of this. Jesus is with us in the storm. And in his unfailing love, Jesus will surely see us through it. Thanks be to God. Amen. The light shines in the darkness, and, and the, the darkness, darkness has not overcome it.
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Bless our God, praise and thanks to